Coming up on the Mobile Journalism Show. They've had over 50 million views um, as a series. I think the, the most viewed one has been on Facebook. It's things not to say to someone with Downs and the, that has had 14 million or 13 million views. So today's topic, what videos work on mobile? We're joined by Brendan Miller, a BBC producer who's been involved in some of the BBC's most viral videos. Welcome to the Mobile Journalism Show. If you're a mobile journalist, marketer or creative who makes content on a mobile device or for mobile audiences, you're in the right place. Keeping you up to date with the fast moving world of mobile, here's your host and mobile video specialist, Mark Egan. So sorry you've had to wait for a new episode. I've got lots of guests lined up. It's just been a, a crazy period of time. Uh, but we've got a great guest today. Firstly, I'll say um, apologize for the audio quality. Um, literally, this was just grabbed in a side room. So if there's any knocking or banging of the phone, I apologize for that. But it's a great episode, lots of really good uh, tips and advice. So let's dive in. Okay, so Brendan, thanks for joining me in this weird side room in a hotel in uh, Lithuania. Um, but it's the only quiet place around here. Um, so let's get straight down to it. Um, tell me a bit about, you know, when you first started to realize that uh, you maybe had a knack for figuring out uh, what people like to see when it comes to video online and specifically on social platforms. Uh, yeah, it was it was kind of by accident. We were making some short form content for a show called Free Speech, which was um, a BBC Three version of Question Time, and um, we were trying lots of different things. And one of them just went viral, and it was it was called Things That Say to a Trans Person, and it was just interviews with um, eight trans people. And um, it was, yeah, it just sort of took off and it was being shared and tweeted and that was the first kind of time I had that kind of viral high, seeing your kind of content being shared by your friends and so on. And that just, um, that's quite magic like when that happens because it feels like you're really making an impact. And I think also like when you're, when something comes via a broadcaster in a kind of top down way, you know, it feels like, oh, the BBC is telling you to like trans people or something. Um, then it's not as impactful when, as when, you know, your mate has shared it and sort of said, yes, I really agree with it. And the kind of stuff I'm really interested in about, like, which is sort of political like that, you know, overcoming stereotypes, trying to get people to understand other people. Um, I feel like it works better on those social platforms. And so tell me a bit about that particular video. So what was, it, what was the, the content and why did that content resonate? Sure. Well, it was a, um, it was just a, blank backdrop, two um, trans people com uh, having a conversation and they would pick things out of a bowl uh, and we sort of did that little setup with four different pairs of people and then we intercut them. So they were sort of talking about like um, the, out of the bowl they'd pick out something that people shouldn't say to them. So it would be like, oh, can I see a picture from before? And then they'd talk sassily about like how frustrating that is or annoying that is. Um, or someone, or something else they pick up the bowl would be like, oh, have you had the up? And they were like, well, can you stop asking me about my genitals? Or, you know. And um, the thing that I really liked about it, um, and it wasn't just me that made it, but it was a great little team that put it together, was that it felt like they were talking to them each other in a way, rather than trying to kind of make it simple or explain it for poor people that don't understand, it was like, we don't, we don't give a crap, we're just going to laugh about how stupid questions um, and that sort of turned into a format um, which BBC Three has been sort of running ever since I did two series which is like 33 films and I think there's now over 50 of kind of pairs of people sitting behind a table with that bowl um, and it's yeah we've done everything from quite heavy stuff to um, quite light stuff so we've done like things not to say to a refugee or things not to say to British Muslims things not, and then we've also done things not to say to a northerner living in the south or you know taking the mick out of their accent or so the kind of talking points done in sort of a more humorous way um, you know what's the reaction mean? what kind of viewership are you getting on this uh, yeah it's been it's been great it's um, they've had over 50 million views um, as a series I think the, the most viewed one has been on Facebook, it's things not to say to someone with Downs and the, that has had 14 million or 13 million views at least on on um, Facebook. There's one, things not to say to someone with a facial disfigurement which is, I think it's the most watched video on YouTube, uh, on BBC Three's channel. Um, yeah, they've gone all over the place, we've seen other people like starting to 
do the format. I think Jeremy Corbyn even did, there was even one, things not to say to a Jeremy Corbyn supporter, which the Labour Party made, which was, I think they even had the same bottle. So it's sort of, go, it's the concept homage. itself yeah. has become viral and been repeated and used elsewhere. Now, obviously you came through the traditional TV route with the BBC, um, and there's a weird thing where, you know, in the past there were certain rules of video and you followed those rules and everybody knew the rules. And now, because we've got all these different platforms and people are looking on, viewing on mobile, mm. it feels like everything's kind of been thrown up in the air and there's a whole new set of rules emerging. Um, so what do you think the main thing that people who come from a more traditional video background get wrong when it comes to making video for mainly for social platforms or online viewers? Oh gosh, there's loads. Um, so, some of it's very practical. Uh, things like wide shots are not going to really do well on a mobile. Um, things like your subtitles, like everyone who comes out of film school, um, or, or like titles, everyone who comes out of film school has those very small little titles in the middle of the screen and now they actually need to be nice and big. And Yeah, and everyone's putting subtitles on now, which is good, but they're still done in a quite uncreative, boring way. And if you look at um, what some of the best publishers are doing, they're actually making them much more interesting and visually engaging, or combining them with, with voiceover in a way. So some very sort of practical things. Um, and also things like... Um, the first five seconds of your video on Facebook is the main thing. Like That's much more important than is your video short or what's the title of your video, for Facebook at least. Um, but then when you get to YouTube, like the title and the thumbnail is the, the key thing. And too often it's like at the end of the process, um, the producers go, just hand it over to some YouTube um, publisher. And it's like, I'll just put a title on it, I don't know. Um, so yeah, some very like practical things about just how you're framing and uh, your titling and images and all that sort of stuff. But there's a sort of deeper thing for me, which is about like why um, why are people going to share your video? And again, it's not something we're used to thinking about. Um, I think that it's yeah. That, that, I mean, there's lots of different reasons why someone might share something. Um, and are you saying that it's important because in the past the distribution was you press play, it gets broadcast. And that's it, you've distributed it. Whereas if it's going to work on social, you need a bit of help <laughs> from the actual users. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the, your users are your distributors. You know, the people, you need people to click that share button. And not many people do it, but the people who do do it are the ones who are going to make your content seen. And that, that's a massive change from that sort of direct relationship uh, that television has. You're relying on other people to be your... So on things not to say, um, part of its sort of viral strategy in air quotes is that it has a core of people who the film is for, whether that's trans people or that's people with Downs or people, you know, there's a, or, um, autism's a really good, um, that was one of the first ones that went big when we were going again. And it needs that network or that community that is going to share it. Um, and they kind of push it out and what give it that sort of push at the beginning but to get it going viral. And sometimes you can get groups where... I remember we were thinking about, should we do a film about vegetarians or a film about vegans? And actually, vegans was a much better option, even though it was a smaller group. They were much more networked, they are much more passionate, they kind of have to put up with more crap because everyone hates vegans. Um, it was just, it, it was interesting because th that film did do really well and it, it came from having a strongly networked group. You know, they've got email lists, they're a group that is geographically dispersed but needs information you know they need to find out if Mars bars are vegan or not um, so they get on the internet they get on email list to sort of c communicate with each other and um, so it sounds like the way you're approaching it where sometimes people say we'll make a video that will keep a lot of people happy mm -hmm. you're saying no actually the more kind of niche we go in the same way that we when people talk about you know video marketing for businesses mm -hmm. you know it's segmenting that audience rather mm -hmm. than trying to deal with the whole one is that something that you actually think um, you know, who have we not sort of served, who have we not targeted, let's move on to them. And my follow-up question to that is, is the danger then that you're not making editorial decisions based on what's a good thing to cover, but the fact that actually, yeah, this will get shared a lot? Yeah, I, um, do, we make, do we make decisions based on will we get an audience or not? Uh, yeah, I think we do. I think that happens all over TV and broadcasting, even in newsrooms, they're like, oh, you know, people love this this topic or people are talking about this topic. So we totally um, do go after uh, big audiences. And that's partly because 
you know, like the stuff I want to make is about overcoming stereotypes or, you know, it's got that point to it and you don't really succeed in that mission unless you do reach a big audience. Um, I feel like I've forgotten your question. <laughs> not well, yeah, I mean, I was just uh, talking about, like, um, understanding, you know, segmenting the audience, right. understanding the audience, having kind of, you know, often we have, like, an avatar for, like, this is the audience for this particular yeah. output. It sounds like instead of having one avatar, you've broken it down into a bunch of different avatars. Would that be fair? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm a massive advocate for, you know, not trying to make stuff for a general audience. I feel like that's a very TV way of thinking. And the internet just is made up, is powered by communities, is powered by groups. And 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 you have to kind of connect into, or if you can connect into those, then you're going to have a real advantage. Obviously, if you are building your own following, you kind of hope that the people following your page and so on become your kind of your advocates, your community, your, your ambassadors. But so often, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think about um, what community out there is is not served. And it's often, it's often narrower than we're used to thinking about. So, yeah, I remember when we started thinking about and we want to do stuff on mental health, um, we were like, right, we're not going to do stuff about mental health it's going to be about specific things we'll do it about schizophrenia we'll do it about um, bipolar and often the test is for me is like well what level does that community think about it like is there a subreddit for that thing is there a facebook group is there a what's that email list and they're like mental health is a kind of good example it's like lots of people are affected by mental health it's a big group but that's not really how people with those conditions group themselves they don't sign up to a mental health blog they're sign up to the one that's more relevant to them or like it's you know um, BBC3 just did a doc about diabulimia which I don't think many people have heard of it's, been, it's had like a done incredibly well in a short amount of time because it was about it's an eating disorder related to diabetes and it was like it was yeah it just really it was the film that people were who were affected by that condition have been waiting to see and I think often TV takes a topic and sort of um, or a group and sort of looks at them and um, from a kind of general point of view. It's like, well, I don't know anything about this, but this is the questions I'd have. Whereas I think it works much better online is to sort of start with that community and make the thing that they've been dying to see, that the, the, give them the voice that they haven't had. Um, and I, like, so when I remember, when I do films with prof professions, so I, when I'm like, we do things not to say to a doctor or things not to say to a teacher I tell them like just imagine you're in the staff room like don't define anything you know, people have Google you know don't use jargon just speak to each other like you would be speaking normally that's the conversation I want to capture and um, when you look around besides obviously your great work who do you think is getting it right where you know if who do you think yep yeah, they get video when it comes to kind of social platforms it's kind of native maybe it's specific to each platform who do you look at and you think, yeah, they're actually pretty good? Uh, in which space? I mean, there's so well, many. Well, in the sense of, um, you know, mind? if 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 somebody was saying, right, I usually make TV, but I want to learn oh, right. what good social video looks like. Mm. Who do you think? Yeah, these guys got it nailed. Um, so I'm a big admirer of BuzzFeed. Um, I think that they do some incredible stuff. A lot of it's, you know, in the leisure space. It's in that kind of relax you know it's not trying to be um you know necessarily informative or something but they really understand or culturally they're obsessed with what makes people share um and what are people doing online and so on and some very smart stuff comes out of that um uh, the sort of more news space i think channel 4 news on facebook then got a really good um idea about why people want to share you know they always have that sort of strong opening they always have a often it's got a kind of social justice feel to it so people are like sharing it to kind of show people that they care and it's also about often underreported stories which people feel deserve a bigger audience um i thought their a series on aleppo was amazing and um, really heart you know a, heart-rending pieces but very simple often there's a piece um, which is like I think it's like way over 50 million views just about this little baby who's been brought in um, a mother and a baby who's been brought in after a bomb attack and it's just a few minutes and it's basically you're wondering whether the the baby's going to survive and it's quite graphic imagery but the you know the baby's not breathing you're like running for it and then the baby wakes up and it's got some really good 
written journalism at the bottom of it. It's very simple. It's not try. It's not no reporter in the middle of it. It's just someone has written and put together a very simple story, um, and. And I think that's often something we, in TV, we would be like, right, let's take that moment and build a whole documentary around it. And it's going to be hours long and it's going to start with the beginning and talk about the background. And, and that just that moment was actually something that was really powerful. Yeah, I mean, that's an incredible piece. And so in a sense, um, you know, it comes back to almost what you were saying before, that in the past we try and package everything up so the whole story is in one video. Mm. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is sometimes just that little snippet of a story um, on social, that's what can work. You don't yeah. feel you have to tell absolutely every element of the entire story all at once. Is that would that yeah. be fair? Yeah, and I so there's a there's a program in the UK called the Unre- Unreported World, and it was often sort of unwatched world as well. Like it's on on a Friday, and it, um, and it's not got, hasn't in the past had a very big audience from what I know, and it's very um, good journalism. It's inter- uh, journalism from around the world things that are going on in different countries. Anyway, Channel 4 News have done an incredible job of working with that show. Um, and they just do the same thing. They watch the doc. They try and find one moment, not the whole thing. They're not trying to summarise. Uh, they're not trying to make a trailer. In fact, they're, that's like one of their sort of explicit don't make a trailer for Facebook. It never works. Um, just take a moment that just really makes you feel something or has got, you know, has got a reason to share behind it and just isolate that and... And actually, that's worked wonders for Unreported World. It's like, you know, the the clips that um, and the clips have been viewed millions of times. And I think as a result, the profile and the the sort of viewership of the of actual show has gone gone much higher. Um, now, getting on to kind of technicalities. So, mm. um, if you're making content for say Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, let's just sure. take those three. Um, how would you approach each platform differently? So you've done the same story, you've got the same video content. <clears throat> what would you tweak for each one? So Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. How would you approach those platforms slightly differently? Sure. Well, the um, so it's I wouldn't. I'd try and think about them at the beginning because I feel like often this is the problem with how we make online video is like we make it then we're like oh we're going to publish it now what we just put some subtitles on it and actually the the soul of those things are very different so for me youtube um is much more similar to television and um, platforms like iplayer or netflix in the it's about the title and it's about the thumbnail and it's about getting people to click and that's kind of like what you're doing on the epg like you're just like oh which program should i watch so um, when I talk to a lot of YouTube creators um, like who, who are really doing well, they actually start with the thumbnail and the title. You know, it's, it's, that's the thing that development process starts with that. Um, and then actually, like, uh, yeah, YouTube film can, um, can be much more similar to normal TV. It can go, th- you know, take you on a journey, a beginning, middle of an end and all that sort of stuff. Facebook, um, you can use those sort of meme bars at the top and bottom to be your title, but generally it doesn't really have a title and the title's not relevant and often people aren't even clicking it because it just auto plays. But it's all about that first, you know, that sort of burst of what happens in that first five, ten seconds. Is there a moment of drama? Is there a question? Is there something that feels like um, ATTN did this wonderful series which is sort of two countries compared and so you have this sort of split screen of, and on the left it's like, drought in Israel and on the right it's like drought in the USA and, and it's like what can we learn from Israel and there's, they've got these amazing desalination plants and they've solved their drought problems and it's like just that initial um, A versus B thing can be a very powerful start um, so and yeah and, the, and, and like I was talking about the simplicity that's really important on, on Facebook. On Instagram you don't have a share button so it's much more about um, um, like that long-term relationship. Um, I think um, there's not a lot of publishers who I feel like have really found a good way to do Instagram. Um, one of the stuff stuff we found on BBC Three that works quite well is about sort of the behind-the-scenes stuff or trying to find beautiful images and stuff. I think it's also um, so. I feel like I don't in my understanding or. <clears throat> excuse me, my understanding of thinking about Instagram is like less developed than Facebook and YouTube. I think like one of the things is why people go in there. It feels like people go to Instagram as this place to kind of get a little pick-me-up, some picture of beauty or some kind of motivation or some kind of 
positive feeling. Um, so yeah, trying to trying to focus on that again, little moments that make you feel good, and building a long term relationship would probably be my approach. Okay, and beginning to wrap up now. Um, obviously, uh, the listener here is interested in mobile journalism, mm-hmm. so using your phone to go out and shoot stuff, whatever. Um, what do you think the opportunities are to use, um, you know, making on mobile for mobile? So I'm thinking here about the fact that you know you could you can take pictures, whack out a GIF, um, whatever it is. The whole kind of non sort of standard mm. video. You've got sort of 360. You've got all sorts of sort of ways that you can create content. If somebody was going out and covering a story, for instance, mm. um, besides the bog standard video do you have any other thoughts on what kind of stuff works with the social platforms what kind of extra content around there for, for Facebook feeds and so on yeah sort of things to sort of tell the story in other ways or to promote the story yeah I, um, I don't know how good an answer I have for this I feel like um, I mean this it really depends what you're doing on your on that on that platform I feel like um, one of the problems with a lot of platforms is they're not consistent enough so um, you you know if you've got wildly different content um, in, on the same feed whether that's YouTube or Facebook that can really like cause problems um, but like if you if you've got a little home for that sort of behind the scenes stuff or the more conversational stuff I think that can really work well depending on the on the platform um, and like replying in the comments and, and just having more of a kind of longer interaction with your audience seems like a good idea is that what you were sort of thinking about yeah i mean in the sense that um uh if you're on mobile you're out and about you mm-hmm. can take different things so i mean that's a fair point don't necessarily hit your feed with because you can do all these different things with all these different formats it may not sort of suit the brand um so pick the right tool for the right job a quick thing your thoughts on um, vertical versus landscape versus square video sure um uh, yeah, like uh, the, I remember, verticals here. Um, it's it's not like a you know. Remember the backlash against vertical video. You know, our eyes aren't uh, vertical. You know, we need to. Um, oh, should I start that again? <laughs> um, yeah, um, like YouTube still feels like a very sixteen by nine space. It's starting to change more, but it still feels like the reason why people go there is to kind of have a longer. Um, more immersive experience and so they're much happier to sort of turn their phone and, and, and work with it in that way. Um, vertical video is 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 really nice. It gets you're using more of the space on your phone. One thing we found is that um, pe- sometimes um, vertical is sort of too vertical and it, because it, you're used, it's full 916 um, people don't really want to click through and like say you're on Facebook and a vertical video comes up, um, the only way to sort of really see it properly is to click the click the phone, and a lot of people don't want to do that because they're not sure what it is yet. Whereas once it's got going, they'll like click through it, and they actually want to still see the description at the top to sort of while it's going, they want to keep that little bit of information there. So we found actually like um, when we're using vertical, just a little bit, a little bit squeezed. Um, so. I guess my, you know, like, do you know, do you know what I mean? Not as as vertical as you might think. Just get l- a little bit shorter than that. Yeah. Um, and I remember one at Bloomsbury did one about Harry Potter, and um, like people didn't know quite that it was vertical, and so there was this sort of thing going on at the very bottom, which they just never saw because they they thought they were watching it all, um, but they weren't. So yeah, vertical just as people as audiences are getting used to it, that I feel like there's there'll be a sort of shift. Um, as, you know, on that so more, that's sort of where the square is getting popular, isn't it? The yeah. Use up so the, the kind of the right amount of screen. And well, well, square square is um, I don't know. I've got a designer friend who's just like square is a compromise. You should just either go for one or the other. And that, I, well, I like that the square is quite nice at uh, kind of doing a, a sort of in between as we as I as think audiences get more and more used to vertical. Um, something we do on things not to say is um, we have burnt in subtitles on Facebook, obviously, but we um, we don't. We, we film it sort of 16.9 mainly for sort of resource reasons and that's the sort of format that's established so we film the same thing for YouTube and f- but when we put it on Facebook we put the, the subtitles 
underneath so what you get is like not full square it's just a slightly sort of stocky 16 uh, 9 so I guess it's more 4-3 back to the <laughs> back to the old days yeah um, all that works quite well <laughs> <laughs> okay well brilliant well thank you for uh, letting me drag you into this um very sort of dodgy looking um, a side room um, whilst there's you're probably missing out on the coffee break um, here at this uh, conference here in Vilnius um, but thank you very much if people sort of want to get in touch with you or learn more about you or sure. book you to speak or whatever well, where do they find you? Uh, yeah on Twitter my handle is uh, BrenKJM um, or if you Google Brendan Miller you video you'll probably come across me If you like this podcast don't forget to subscribe And we'd love it if you would leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher. To get in touch with Mark, go to www.purplebridgemedia.com or tweet him at Mark Egan Video.